Hello and welcome to another installment of Chini Reads. This is Call of the Wild 5, Chapter 2, Part 1. So today, as always, we are looking at how some of the dialogue and the events propel the action and reveal characters throughout the story or the aspects of the character. We're specifically looking at, through this entire novel, how does Buck change from the beginning of the novel to the end of the novel? And in this section, we are looking at how Buck's life changed depending on the person who owns him. And what does he learn from these people? Who appears to be a better owner or trainer than the other one? And after we are done reading, you are going to answer some questions based on evidence from the text. So what happened last time? Buck encountered the man with a red sweater. And he beat Buck into submission with a club so that Buck would obey him. And now because of this, Buck has learned to fear the club and will never let anyone near him again with another club. And you will see this again in the very short future within the next chapter or two. Um, that he, he makes this vow to himself and, and he absolutely keeps it. So in this chapter, Buck also meets his new owners and his new team. So he meets Perot and Francois, who would become his new owners and trainers. They like Buck immediately. They see the value in him. They see that he is a good dog and he's beautiful. And he learns that they are fair and he could trust their judgment. He also meets some of the new dogs on the team. So Curly is very kind and Dave just wants to be left alone. However, Spitz is the one that he needs to watch out for the most. He's already stolen some of Buck's food and as a result, Buck gets punished by Francois. So we learn very quickly that um, Spitz is not a character to be reckoned with. He is dangerous and to avoid him if possible. All right, so we're going to watch this quick video about how a dog sled is built. Now, understand the way it would have been built in Perot and Francois' day is a little bit different. They talk about that, but essentially it's kind of all sort of the same. All right, so why is this dog sled so important? How is it going to help the musher and how is it going to help the dogs in the process? You're banging in trees, you're bumping off tussocks, going over rocks. One of the, the main tasks at that time for me was to build a sled that was almost indestructible. Dog sleds have changed a lot over the years. In the 1800s, the sleds were large basket sleds with the, the wood slats for the bed. They were a lot larger because um, they weren't just going out for fun. If they were using a dog team, they were usually traveling a long distance and were carrying a great deal of, of goods. Modern racing has transformed sleds from heavy, wooden, and slow to light, fast, and able to take a beating. We've used a lot of different materials, a lot of plastics, a lot of aluminum, a lot of carbon fiber. So what are the main parts of a dog sled? The runners. Um, you have to have something for the sled to slide on the snow. If it's 30 above like it is today, we have a certain plastic that works for that. If it's 50 degrees below, we have a certain plastic that works for that. And the next part is the bed. That's where you put your gear, your rides in there. Um, those are held up in the air, off the ground, by what's called the stanchions. And these are the vertical members of the sled that come up and attach to what's called the driving bow or handlebar. The other main component that every sled has to have is some kind of front end, what we call brush bow. If you're coming at a tree, it's triangle shaped and you can't steer around the tree. Um, when you hit the tree, it deflects you off. That's how you keep a sled moving, but what about stopping? So we have what's called the brake bar or claw brake. And then once you stop them, we use what's called a snow hook and we just jam that down in the snow or ice and it holds the team from going. Now the other way that we kind of keep the team speed control is by using what's called the drag mat or stomp pad. And so it actually creates friction and holds the team slower. We stand on that with both feet or one foot or whatever amount of friction you need to control the team. Those are the individual pieces, but every sled design is at least a little unique. Especially in the thousand mile race is what's called the tail dragger seat. It's nice to be able to take a load off and sit down. And so usually what I do is I put my cooler in this bag and then I sit on that. And I try to do that as much as possible because when I get to a checkpoint, it's go, 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 go. I gotta take care of those dogs. I gotta keep moving so that then I can lay down and take a nap quick so that we can get back on the trail. And each musher has their own style and their own favorite sled setup. Um, there are a lot of people who like to build their own sleds. I mean, mushers are very 
Um, I don't know, we all like to do our own thing and do it our own way. And so you see a lot, a lot of people build their own sleds in Alaska. So out of anywhere, there's probably the most sled builders in Alaska. Sleds have come a long way over the last hundred years, from traditional wooden sleds to ones made from cutting edge materials. A dog sled has to be light, strong, and comfortable in order to be a great tool. So um, as you saw in that video, dog sleds have evolved quite a bit over the last hundred years. They used to be heavy, slow, and wood, and those are the types of dog sleds that we're going to be dealing with in Call of the Wild right now that Francois and Perrault and all the other characters are going to be working with and that the dogs are going to be pulling. Um, one thing you might have also noticed in that video is some of the dogs wear booties. So these are created now to help protect a dog's feet from the cold and the snow and the ice and the things that would get packed in there. They did not have those in Buck's time. So at some point, Buck's feet are going to hurt him um, because he's not used to running and he's not used to pulling a sled. So that's something that's going to come up as well is that dogs would have to build up tougher feet in order for this to happen. All right, so you're going to continue this video um, in which I continue to read the um, text to you. You're going to then answer some sh questions on Schoology, and please use the race format for short answers. All right. All right, so here we are at part uh, one of chapter two, and we are entering into the law of club and fang. Buck's first day on the Dia Beach was like a nightmare. Every hour was filled with shock and surprise. He had been suddenly jerked from the heart of civilization and flung into the heart of things primordial. No lazy sun-kissed life was this, with nothing to do but loaf and be bored. Here was neither peace nor rest, nor a moment's safety. Always confusion and action, and every moment life and limb were in peril. There was imperative need to be constantly alert, for these dogs and men were not pound dogs and men. They were savages, all of them, who knew no law but the law of club and fang. He had never seen dogs fight as those wolfish creatures fought, and his first experience taught him an unforgettable lesson. It is true. It was a vicarious experience, else he would not have lived to profit by it. Curly was the victim. They were camped near the log store where she, in her friendly way, made advances to a husky dog the size of a full-grown wolf, though not half so large as she. There was no warning, only a leap in like a flash, a metallic clip of teeth, a leap out equally swift, and Curly's face was ripped open from eye to jaw. It was the wolf manner of fighting, to strike and leap away, but there was more to do than this. Thirty or forty huskies ran to the spot and surrounded the combatants in an intent and silent circle. Buck did not comprehend that silent intentness, nor the eager way with which they were licking their chops. Curly rushed her antagonist, who struck again and leapt aside. He met her next rush with his chest, in a peculiar fashion that tumbled her off her feet. He never regained them. This was what the onlooking huskies had waited for. They closed in upon her, snarling and yelping, and she was buried, screaming with agony, beneath the bristling mass of bodies. So we have to look at the idea of what lesson does Buck learn about how to act towards other dogs. Essentially, he's just learned the idea that the nicer you are and the kinder you are, the nastier dogs will be. So unfortunately, we have this really graphic section with, with Curly in which Curly gets attacked by the other dogs and killed in the process. And it seems very brutal and very violent, but this is something, sadly, that Buck had to see because this is going to shape his personality. It's going to shape who he becomes and the fact that he does not trust other dogs at this point and he learns very quickly who he can trust and who he cannot and that is part of his evolution of becoming wild 
So sudden was it, and so unexpected, that Buck was taken aback. He saw Spitz run out his scarlet tongue in a way he had of laughing, and he saw Francois swinging an axe, springing into the mess of dogs. Three men with clubs were helping him to scatter them. It did not take long. Two minutes from the time Curly went down, the last of her assailants were clubbed off. But she lay there, limp and lifeless, in the bloody, trampled snow, almost literally torn to pieces. Bart half-breed standing over her and cursing horribly. The scene often came back to Buck to trouble him in his sleep. So that was the way. No fair play. Once down, that was the end of you. Well, he would see to it that he never went down. Spitz ran out his tongue and laughed again, and from that moment Buck hated him with a bitter and deathless hatred. Before he had recovered from the shock caused by the tragic passing of Curly, he received another shock. Francois fastened him upon an arrangement of straps and buckles. It was a harness such as he had seen the grooms put on the horses at home. And as he had seen horses work, so he was set to work, hauling Francois on a sled to the forest that fringed the valley and returning with a load of firewood. Though his dignity was sorely hurt by thus being made a draft animal, he was too wise to rebel. He buckled down with a will and did his best, though it was all well and strange. Francois was stern, demanding instant obedience, and by virtue of his whip, receiving instant obedience. While Dave, who was an experienced wheeler, nipped Buck's hind quarters whenever he was in error. Spitz was the leader, likewise experienced, and while he could not always get at Buck, he growled sharp reproof now and again or cunningly threw his weight in the traces to jerk Buck into the way he should go. Buck learned easily, and under the combined tuition of his two mates and Francois made remarkable progress. Ere they returned to camp, he knew enough to stop at hole and go ahead at mush, to swing wide on the bends and to keep clear of the wheeler when the load sled shot downhill at their heels. Three very good dogs, Francois told Perrault. That buck, him pull like hell. I teach him quick as anything. So he's basically just been taught how to run in the harness or the traces. Francois, yes, will flick out a whip every now and then, but he's not beating Buck into submission like the man with the red sweater. The other two teachers are going to be Dave, who nips little, little sharp bites, but not enough to hurt him at Buck when Buck is not doing what he needs to do. And Spitz ends up growling and pretty much giving out the message that he's trying to give to Buck about how to fix it. And because of that, in a very, very short amount of time, Buck starts learning how to adapt in the harness. And this quick adaptation is definitely what he needs to become a better sled dog. By afternoon, Perot, who was in a hurry to be on the trail with his dispatches, returned with two more dogs, Billy and Joe, he called them, two brothers and true huskies both. Sons of the one mother, though they were, they were as different as day and night. Billy's one fault was his excessive good nature, while Joe was the very opposite, sour and introspective, with a perpetual snarl and a malignant eye. Buck received them in camaraderie fashion. Dave ignored them while Spitz proceeded to thrash first one and then the other. Billy wagged his tail appeasingly, turned to run when he saw that appeasement was of no avail, and cried, still appeasingly, when Spitz's sharp teeth scored his flank. But no matter how Spitz circled, Joe whirled around on his heels to face him, mane bristling, ears laid back, lips writhing and snarling, jaws clipping together as fast as he could snap, and eyes diabolically gleaming, the incarnation of belligerent fear. So terrible was his appearance that Spitz was forced to forego disciplining him, but to cover his own discomfiture, he turned upon the inoffensive and wailing Billy and drove him to the confines of the camp. 
So we meet two new dogs. So Billy is very much like Curly. He's kind and he's accepting. Um, unfortunately, we saw what happened to Curly as a result of being a nice dog. Um, so this gets him thrashed immediately. It gets him chewed up and fought with by Spitz. And Joe, he's not nice, and he can can hold his own in a fight with Spitz. He stands up to Spitz immediately, and because of that, when Spitz can't get to Joe, he goes back and snaps at Curly, or I'm sorry, at Billy some more, because Billy is nice, and he'll take it, all right? So he can't punish Joe, so he punishes Billy. By evening, Perot secured another dog, an old husky, long and lean and gaunt, with a battle-scarred face and a single eye which flashed a warning of prowess that commanded respect. He was called Solex, which means the angry one. Like Dave, he asked nothing, gave nothing, expected nothing, and when he marched slowly and deliberately into their midst, even Spitz left him alone. He had one peculiarity which Buck was unlucky enough to discover. He did not like to be approached on his blind side. Of this offense, Buck was unwittingly guilty, and the first knowledge he had of his indiscretion was when Solex whirled upon him and slashed his shoulder to the bone for three inches up and down. Forever after, Buck avoided his blind side, and to the last of their comradeship had no more trouble. His only apparent ambition, like Dave's, was to be left alone, though as Buck was afterward to learn, each of them possessed one another an even more vital ambition. So we meet Solex, and he is a very old dog. He would be that, you know, old, wise dog that everyone looks up to. And in this case, you know, he comes in, he's clearly covered with pedal scars from being a sled dog for a very long time. And even Spitz leaves him alone. He's very much like Dave. He wants to be left alone. He wants to be off on the side doing his own thing. He does not want to be part of the sled dog pack drama and mentality. All right. So they say um, that each of them possessed one another an even more vital ambition. So an ambition is a desire or a want. So what do you think that want would be? It's probably most likely that he wants to be left alone and the only thing that really drives them is to run in the sled and be in the traces and to stay alive those are about the only ambitions that these dogs have at this point that night buck faced the great problem of sleeping the tent illuminated by a candle glowed warmly in the midst of the white plain and when he as a matter of course earned it both Perrault and Francois bombarded him with curses and cooking utensils till he recovered from his consternation and fled ignominiously into the outer cold. A chill wind was blowing that nipped him sharply and bit with special venom into his wounded shoulder. He lay down on the snow and attempted to sleep, but the frost soon drove him shivering to his feet. Miserable and disconsolate, he wandered about among the many tents, only to find that one place was co as cold as another. Here and there, savage dogs rushed upon him, but he bristled his neck hair and snarled, for he was learning fast, and they let him go his way unmolested. Finally, an idea came to him. He would return and see how his own teammates were making out. To his astonishment, they had disappeared. Again, he wandered about through the great camp looking for them, and again he returned. Were they in the tent? No, that could not be. Else he would not have been driven out. Then where could they possibly be? With drooping tail and shivering body, very forlorn indeed, he aimlessly circled the tent. Suddenly the snow gave way beneath his forelegs and he sank down. Something wriggled under his feet. He sprang back, bristling and snarling, fearful, of the unseen and unknown, but a friendly little yep reassured him, and he went back to investigate. A whiff of warm air ascended to his nostrils, and there, curled up under the snow in a snug ball, lay Billy. He whined placatingly, squirmed and wriggled to show his good will and intentions, and even ventured as a bribe for peace to lick Buck's face with his warm, wet tongue. So in the end of this, he can't find a place to sleep because remember, these are working dogs. They are not pets. If you see the way that 
um, Francois kind of treats Curly's death, he treats it almost as if it didn't happen. All right. It's not um, like when we have a pet for many years and we lose that pet and we're very sad and upset by that. He just kind of moves on with his day and he's angry that he's just lost one of his dogs and probably lost all that money, but he moves on fairly quickly. So because of that, these dogs, they're not allowed to sleep in the tent. They're not allowed to curl up and stay warm. They're not allowed to become fat and lazy. They have to go sleep outside because keep in mind, dogs like Huskies and, and these dogs that are bred for, for sled dogging and whatnot, their coats grow thicker the more they are exposed to cold. So they need that exposure to cold for their, for their coats to develop and to keep them warm. So he learns fairly quickly again that the dogs sleep under the snow. So this happens for two reasons. Number one, it keeps them sheltered from any snowstorms or anything like that that's going on outside of that little bubble. And number two, when they curl up in the snow, it creates a little cave for them that stays warm and keeps them warm from their own body heat and their own exhalation. And the same thing is true for people. Um, if you hopefully never have this happen but if you ever find yourself stranded in the snow somewhere and there's no shelter and there's no tent and there's no way to get warm you crawl into a little you know cave that you make of your own that you you carve out of the snow and you're able to keep warm if anybody has ever seen um survivor man there's an episode where he goes to alaska and does this very thing I do not recommend going out into the snow and attempting to make this happen. It's only for a matter of survival. All right. Now that we have finished with the chapter, you're going to go through. You have a matching section and some multiple choice sections as well. And then you have a short answer section. All right. So that will be uploaded into the Schoology quiz. Please finish that, and that will be your work for Tuesday of this week. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.